and I'm going to welcome everyone to a conversation with Libby Price from the Philo Project. Welcome Libby. My name is Emma Smith. Um, I'm the project manager with Empowered Conversations, which is an Age UK Salford project. Uh, we collectively deliver communication courses for family carers and also professionals across Greater Manchester. And we also have one-to-one -one support that we deliver through Empowered Carers. And as a result of COVID, we've been doing things like this. So we have webinar, we have a webinar, regular webinar. Uh, we have a disco, we have singing group, we have groups for carers. So there's a whole host of extra stuff that we've sort of continued to, to de deliver. Um, so that's who we are. Um, plan for today is that Libby and I are going to have a conversation, sort of says what it, it, it does on, on, on the tin, conversation with. Um, if you have any questions, and if you haven't been to one of these before, whack it in the Q&A. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see Q&A. So just pop your question in there. And then for the last 20 minutes, we will be picking up questions from there as well. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Um, if you can put your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat, because sometimes the chat bouncing on and off um, can be a little bit distract distracting while we're having a chat. I hope that's OK. Um, I think that's probably everything I need to tell you. So I think we're going get, to get started. You ready, Libby? I'm ready. Yep. Good to go. Right. Why is the Philo Project called the Philo Project? Uh, I thought you might ask that one. Um, well, I we couldn't think what else to call it. That's the honest answer at the beginning. When seven years ago, when Liz, my co-director, and I were formulating our organisation, we we had to obviously have a name, and we didn't want it to be a stigmatising name, as as you know, Emma. I'm a bit keen on avoiding stigma, and. Um, Liz said to me, what, what do you see in your head, Libby? And I said, well, I kind of see layers building, layers of building up, if you like, a bit like phyllo pastry, and it ends up being something quite substantial. Um, and then I, and then we, that kind of stuck a little bit. And then we were making Dropbox folders and, and uh, files on the computer, and we were calling them phyllo one, phyllo two, phyllo three, and it kind of, we still hadn't called, thought of a name. And, and then I said to Liz, well, why don't we just call it the Philo Project? Because it's a work in progress. It's never going to stay the same. It's always going to be moving. And it stuck. And it's actually been, been one of the loveliest things because it's, it's imagery that our cohort of uh, people coming really like. They refer it often to their Philo days. It doesn't have a stigma to it. It's not to do, it doesn't use demeaning language. Um, it's not a sort of derogatory term but also it it means we can use it in, all, in in a manner of ways and we're kind of now looking at things like dementia hubs and things which can come under the umbrella of a project but we still keep our core values exactly the same and our work the same but I also and I must just um there are two more things one is that um it does actually mean philo, spelt slightly differently, it does mean love and care in ancient Greek. And I didn't know that at the time. So I'm just telling you that now. I've learned that. But also, I, I often use it as, as the imagery of, you know, peeling back the layers that aren't quite so good and focusing on what is still intact. And that relates really well to memory. So all in all, it's been quite a fortuitous um, name, philo, because it does give us quite a lot to work with, if you see what I mean. I bet you weren't expecting that. <laughs> no, I wasn't at all. And, you know, like, unless you don't like pastry, phyllo just it just sounds delicious, doesn't it? You, I'm straight away thinking, is it like a honey nut type phyllo sweet or is it is it a savoury? So, it, or, yeah, I love it. And actually, love it. some people do their days with us. They do talk about their lunch club. So it kind of fits in well in that way as well. So, yes, it's a, it's a positive word, I think, positive name. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you. So for anybody that doesn't know what the Philo Project does, would you tell us, please? Yeah, it's very simple. We provide a day out for people in the community living with uh, ch the challenges of older age, uh, most significantly and in large part with memory loss, um, with or without a d uh, dementia diagnosis. Um, but we also support people with Parkinson's, stroke, um, sensory loss, all the, you know, many, many challenges of older age and quite a lot of those all come together in one go sometimes too. So it's a way that people can 
uh, enjoy a day out with friends, but in a meaningful, manageable context. So it's not generic daycare. Um, it's not, you know, well, uh, in post COVID times, you know, COVID times, you know, group sizes are smaller anyway, but we have about up to four in a group with a host and the host looks after those clients in his or her home and they have the day together the host provides transport which is normal it's again not generic it's not a minibus going around the houses for an hour and a half with collecting all manner of people so people feel very connected with the familiar benefits of what we do so the host is the same host it's it's a regular day it's the same day every week and some people come three four five times a week to us depending on their need it also provides a really meaningful break for carers so carers are getting a whole day off, which is hugely valuable, as I'm sure you, you all know. Um, and it's where the cared for the person living with dementia or whatever really enjoys going. It's, it's a day out with friends. It's not, it's not a day, daycare is a difficult word. Um, it, has a, a, it does have demeaning connotations. And for many people, it, it's the last thing you think you, you're going to be doing, you know, potentially. So it's, we don't talk about it as daycare to those coming. We... We talk about it as, as a day out or a day out with friends or a lunch club, as I say. Um, so it's a day out with a host and the hosts are employed by us to look after up to four people in their own home. Yeah. Libby, it just make, I'm going to be smiling throughout this conversation because it just makes me smile. I just smile at how lovely this is, what we're talking about. It's just so different and so far from what I see you know across greater Manchester as like a solution for somebody you know we know that a carer might need some time away but the solutions out there just they're not they just do not sound as lovely as what you're offering at the Philo project well I don't think that I think often the solutions well sadly a lot of solutions don't exist anymore a lot of really good organizations have gone to the wall um I think it, it, quite often, I think I said to you earlier, we base what we do on how does it make me feel for the person coming. So, you know, if you have significant short term memory loss to to actually to, to have a repetition, a familiarization, um, it's grounding, it's it's rhythmical, it's beneficial, it's enjoyable, it's nutritious, it, it ticks lots and lots of boxes. And we see we see knock on benefits of it. So it's, it's so it's a really obvious thing. Also, I'd say it's the most simple form of an idea. It's not rocket science. Uh, it's not trying to do clever. Too, it's not trying to be too clever. But it's a culture. I think this is what we're getting at. We we really 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 feel that we, the the culture of what we do is the most important thing, and it's focusing on sociable social care. And I think that's the, the big narrative, isn't it? It's all about social care at the moment, but nobody really thinks about the broad, what, the, what actually is in there. It's not just residential care. It's not just domiciliary care. What is sociable social care? And it's what we do. And it's of huge value because if you keep people happier, you're going to keep them at home for longer. You're going to keep the carer supported for longer. You're going to delay the entry into residential care. You're going to reduce the risk of falls you're going to keep people out of hospital so but it's the last thing on everybody's list isn't it you know people it's oh, well it's you know we've just got to focus on other things and so we're that's one of the things I think through you know that our, our you know to sound, I don't sound conceited but our our relative success is that we can start to get this message out louder and clearer um beyond the southwest and see the value that, that this kind of thing brings and um, you know the clients are the ones who will tell you that they love it so you know it's not me telling you it's it's them telling you okay so I want to I, I do want to dig into like exactly what happens like a bit more but mm. before we do that I want to pause I want to rewind so tell me where it came from so you've been going seven years you know where did that come from where did the idea of Philo project okay. come from? well I, I'm a great believer in life life is about chapters okay so I'm you know just in my sixth jet no fifth sixth well I'm 61 nearly um so I think life's about chapters I've done all sorts of interesting things in my life um you know I was a stage manager in the theatre I worked in publishing I've got five children 
I was a garden designer and a childbirth teacher and all those things. And then when I got into my 50s, I, you know, I, like a lot of people, had a slightly different focus and started working when we moved down to Devon with um, actually Age UK in, in Exeter. And they had something called neighborhood daycare, which was similar to what, what we're doing. And I, I started uh, working for them. But it was a very much, it was like, you know, the 27th of 27 services. It was a, it was a small little part of what they did. They did really good work, but it was a small part of what they did. And it was, a, it was, it never really got off the ground. I was the only host, there was another one, she didn't last and so forth. But my clients carried, you know, they were with me. I had two groups a week doing exactly what I've been talking to you about. And my friend, well, she then became my friend, Liz, my co co-founder and business partner was doing her PhD at Exeter University at the time and she asked Age UK if they if she could have any uh, access to people dementia groups and they said well why don't you go and see Libby so she came along and for six months Liz came to me twice twice a week and it, uh, she ended up changing the course of her PhD because it was loosely mu on music and memory and she sort of changed the course of it um, because of what she would, was seeing. And it wasn't really what I was doing, although I probably was doing stuff subconsciously without realising, but it was the way people responded to that, to that approach. And um, we then took, you know, her evidence, if you like, because it was her, her she changed her, her whole thesis was on the interactions and uh, we took it to Age UK and they, they, they said, oh, great, you know, lovely, but, you know, we're very busy. So uh, and we knew they were trying to shut me down because I was the only host left. And we thought this is just too good just to see go. So we decided to start the Philo project um, in my kitchen seven years ago. That's where it was born. And, um, do you know, it's funny because I, ne I never doubted that it would it would just take off. But I had no idea, in fairness, that it would do what it's done. Um, and it's just unraveled, you know, it's just grown exponentially. We've got amazing people working with us. And I think that's one of my most, um, ex one of the most exciting things is in, in, a, in a, again, as a backdrop of recruitment problems, we've got amazing people who work with us who want to come and work at the Philo Project because we employ them, we value them. They love the work they do. And, and most of them got to a bit like the stage in life, like I, had when I wanted to do something more vocational but still be paid for it there's no shame in being paid well for what you do so we pay up with the leading payer in the southwest we're not for profit so we're not driven by financial um you know obviously we're a business we make money and it goes back into the Fila project we pay people well and so people stay with us and they love what they do and and it's it's a wonderful thing so um that the, did I answer your question I'm not sure probably yeah not. you did I do have a tendency to wander off. I'm sorry. <laughs> Pull me back. <laughs> I feel like I need a little cheap dog just like going, come on, this way, this way. No, you absolutely. That was a brilliant answer. Thank you. And that's um, yeah, interesting that it was an it, it was an Age UK project and they didn't quite see the value in it. Whereas... I think I, I understand that. I understand that they're doing so many things and often chasing funding pots. And it, is, it wasn't an it wasn't a viable service for them financially. It didn't make any money. It didn't bring anything into the into the any core costs and stuff. So they and they thought, well, we're doing other stuff with dementia. We don't really need to do this. And so also post they were postcode driven. So you know they were Exeter, a very small city. Um, so they had they, they weren't operating out beyond their their boundaries, so they had no flexibility, whereas we've been able to drive it anywhere and wherever there's a need, which is I mean, Devon is a huge county. I have to say, I don't know whether you, know, you or your um, friends know how big Devon is. It's enormous. Um, and so we were able to go where there's a need. So we're incredibly busy um, across the whole of the county. So wherever we know there's a cluster. Well, there's a need we work with all the different agencies um statutory and otherwise to 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 to, to have feeder project groups and they're easy to, to to make we're not look we're not get running out of um you know buildings that are expensive or difficult um we, we we have hosts and that's where we can pop up very easily so how 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 do i okay so i'm 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 living in devon i'm living with dementia how do i what happens? I want to. I want to come along to the Philo project. Tell me what happens to me. So typically, we have we have probably 50-50 uh, referral rates from the private sector or the 
or the local through the local authority. If it's through the local authority, um, referrals come in straight through into our um, portal um, when we follow up immediately. We always try and make sure everybody has a response immediately to, um, because it's really important. And I think I think one of the things I know, and I'm sure you know on your watch, is that people with so carers supporting people with dementia really do want access to people, not just photocopies or you know online stuff they actually want to talk to, to real people so we have we put a huge value on that so we haven't the other 50 percent of our referrals come via the public either through the website portal as a web form or in person on the telephone and so we take referrals that way and um depending on obviously where we have support we will then trigger that as a referral we have area coordinators who will go out and carry out assessments meet the um the potential clients and family and uh we, we do always do our own assessment because people have to access a, a conventional house we're not talking about um you know a, a purpose-built building necessarily although some some host homes are bungalows which have grab rails and ramps and stuff but mostly we're talking about a conventional house but always has to have a downstairs loo and minimal steps that sort of thing and all hosts homes are risk assessed obviously as you can imagine so we have to make sure we marry up the two but we don't just take somebody and say oh yes we've got a group in exeter on a monday bang that isn't how we work so the the assessment is incredibly important just getting a feel of who that person is who might be coming what their interests are what they can do what they can't do and then we try and align that with the groups that we have where we have capacity so we, we typically might have three options three different groups and we think yeah would and don't make assumptions because i think some people say oh just because uh, somebody's male they want to be with men and it might well be the case they'd love to be in a men's group we've got some wonderful wonderful men's groups but Equally, there may be somebody who's very lonely, widowed, and desperately misses his wife and, and female contact. And so we might think he would be better with a different group, or we might have mixed groups, or do you know what I mean? So, yeah. um, so we don't make any judgments, we don't make any assumptions um, until we've met met somebody, and then we, you know, we play around with the personality of the host, who, where they might be best placed, and and the host. That's a really important thing because the host is the pivot. The host is the person who is a bit, I often say it's a bit like a DJ and you're too young, Emma, but the, you know, in the old days, some of your audience may know this, but you know, when we used to have record players with the, um, the bass and the treble, and you know, there was a bit of a fine balance of turning up the bass or turning down the tech to get, to get, to get that sort of balance. And that's what a group might be like. And the facilitator, if you like, and the, the DJ is the host so it's bringing people in and fading some out if they become a little bit too dominant and that can happen with dementia that natural characteristics can become a little bit too overbearing sometimes so it's it's a question of kindly and and, and intelligently balancing so the the person who might be the least confident feels that they've got a presence and they're not going to just be a wallflower and they have a view and they can say something and contribute so that's that's that what going back to your question and that's what we try and you know get right and we don't always get it right sometimes we might have you know but generally we do we get a, a good feel of where somebody will be best placed sounds like you <clears throat> sounds like you invest a lot of time in making sure that that's going to be the right fit for everybody very much so yeah and it's to do with people's preferences you know we we might i mean we've got a couple of groups down in uh Paynton in Torbay um and our host there 72 she's wonderful and she and her husband uh sort of have their two days that they the care for people and but she's got a very conventional ladies group of a certain age and they're all kind of in their late 80s and they love doing flower arranging and they love doing um you know they just it's just a bit like it's a bit like wi you know stuff and they love it and that equally wouldn't be so appropriate for somebody else and we might have younger people um but also i'm a great believer in just treating people as humans so let's not make judgments i mean i i when i used to host i mean i'll give you an example i had um you know if you make judgments about people just on their background and their education or their means then you're really missing a trick um, and I think so many people make those judgments in our society. And I had a group and I had a complete cross section of people in it. I had 
a chap who was born in India in 1929. Um, he came to the UK in 1947 on, on partition, independence. He couldn't stand the weather. He trained as a pilot, couldn't stand the wet weather in, in, in the UK. So he went off to live in Africa for 50 years. And then finally came back to England in his 80s when he had a heart failure and, and then just went on to, dis, to develop dementia. Um, I mean, he, he didn't have a penny to his name, but he was very well educated. Um, you could make all the wrong assumptions about somebody like him, but he was a fantastic asset to the group because he, he had a wonderful long term memory and he told a very good story. But equally, you know, we, we had people next to him. There's a chap called Barry who, who used to, um, well, he grew up in London and he went to school with the Cray brothers. And it was kind of like, you know, accident rather than judgment. They didn't end up in, in, in where they went. And um, he, he trained as a plumber. He was virtually, uh, you wouldn't have ever thought he had an, edu an education, but he had taught himself poetry later in life. And so we discovered just by, just having time together with a couple in the group who, who liked poetry, Kipling, well, Jeff was Kipling, Robbie Burns, Barry, who you would never have even thought, you know, because we make assumptions in our society, Barry suddenly came ping. And he, he then, everybody just was mesmerized and he just recited Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, you know, it was a wonderful moment. And, and that was a wonderful thing for me because don't just put people together just because they live in suburbia. Don't just put people together just because they haven't got a penny to their name. And I think our organisation, it, it's, it's, it's providing support for everybody, whatever your means. So we are very clear on that. We're not a, we don't just go for private funds and the most expensive hourly rate we can get. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I hope that, that's another rambling answer. Sorry. <laughs> No, but they're so, and I'm sure everybody else is enjoying them. They're not rambling answers because you're just so, you know, it's really illustrating everything that goes on there and just going in great detail as well. So you sort of touched on this a little bit with Barry and poetry, but what would a day look like? So I get picked up. What does it, I guess a day, and we've obviously had the, you know, the ladies who sort of do your more traditional WI type activities. Yeah. Yeah. So any, any group is different. So typically, you're picked up with your by your host with your friends in the car so two or three people in the car passengers you 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 eventually you might go the circuitous route to go home and i mean again i would say let's not judge a, a journey by our own standards because well until well pre-covid we were spending you know, long times in the car and thinking oh you wouldn't wish that on anyone but actually somebody who never goes out a car journey is a really nice thing and, and wherever you live it doesn't matter whether you're rural or whether you're in an urban area there's always something interesting to see so that's the first thing the car journey is really important and as I said to you earlier Emma for some people not driving again is a really difficult thing to come to terms with so being in a car maybe as a, as a co-pilot if you like a navigator and um, that's a great role for some chaps to do um so you come home what do you do when you come in with your friends you put the kettle on okay so it's not and and that is collab everything we do is collaborative um it's 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 about um making people feel part of something so you know there are a lot of people living with dementia who are perfectly capable of getting the mugs out for the tea and the coffee do you know what i mean so why can't they help with that you know supervised obviously with the boiling kettle and so forth um but you know they can help get tea and biscuits out for the group you know we so somebody might we might have a paper lying around oh there's a crossword there should we do the crossword whilst we're all sitting putting the world to rights and deciding what's happening i mean it doesn't matter it's in the moment stuff so for me conversation is incredibly important um, and it's not so much about specific um, exercises and saying or activities and saying we do uh, at the Philo project, we do art at 11 or seated. At, we don't do that. And every group is different and because it depends on the people coming and what they're able to do. And going back to that DJ thing, I mean, there's no point if somebody's got macular disease, um, sensory loss, um, there's no point doing visual things if they can't see. So you might it'd be more conversational, you know, or music is hugely important and music, not because it's an activity, but because music defines us all. Music is, is our primary memory. Music takes us to a place in our lives where, where we've been most happy, um, well, where we've 
happy and sad, but it takes us to where we've lived and what we've done in our lives, it, doesn't it? I mean, that's the, the power of music. And it, so you don't have to do it as a therapy, but music in, in existence in a group to me is, is all important. Yeah. It feels, it feels like a day with you, a day with one of the hosts would be, it would feel quite natural, quite organic. It wouldn't feel like activity driven. And it, cause, cause at home, we're not activity driven, are we? We don't go, oh, let's go and do an activity at the pub. No, exactly. Let's go and do an activity. You know, like it's just normal, okay. isn't it? We're just living. Exactly. In it and- so we're talk, we talk, we treat people as we'd wish to be treated. Um, and, and, you know, and, and then allow them the time and space to actually be able to do those things. You know, somebody with dementia may take a little longer to process it. So don't rush them. If you rush somebody with dementia or you're constantly asking them questions, they're, they're thinking, oh, you know, and it's it's stressful, very stressful. I often liken somebody with significant memory loss to, to a bit a bit like the duck, you know, on the top of the water looking very cut or the swan. But they actually the, the, the feet are going very fast because and how does that make you feel and for a lot of people with dementia um they're desperately trying to present well they're they're trying to give the impression that everything's fine and that must be immensely stressful so everything we do i I, you know i is about understanding how it must be for somebody who's on our watch who's with us and so what do they want to do what don't they want to do um you know, at lunch, you know, getting ready for lunch, laying the table, it's what you do. My friends come over or my children's friends and they ask to help. I said, oh, could you lay the table? That's, a, you know, instead of always saying to somebody, oh no, don't do that. Oh no, 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 it's fine. I'll do it. Let them do it. You know, it doesn't matter if it's not quite right, but it gives somebody the chance of having a role again. And that's what dementia memory loss takes away from people is that sense of having a role, I think. No, I love that. Even like, the best the best day center i could imagine does not come anywhere near what you are offering down there in terms of just a normal day i love that you're going to get picked up and you're going out with your mates and that you might be going on a slightly longer journey yeah. that actually makes yeah. you feel more like you're going yeah. somewhere with with your friends yeah. with people and that also, you're building a relationship with yeah, and, and, and if you think of a minibus comes up and you somebody's put on a minibus with 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 nine other people and, and they can't remember why they're on that minibus and they're thinking I mean it must feel a bit like abduction you know why am I going you know I I don't know you just have to keep thinking back to that and I think um you know the other thing is that uh you know there's so much talk about and I'm not saying it's wrong at all it's on the nice guidelines but cognitive stimulation therapy we do that all the time but we don't market it as an activity because we do that by just engaging that's what you do you know you might You might just by talking and thinking of things together, you're doing cognitive stimulation therapy. You don't need to say, shall we all decide an animal beginning with D because it's a cognitive stimulation exercise. Mm. We just do it because we're we're together and that's what human contact is itself. And that's what's so lacking often with people with dementia. So that makes me think while I'm in that car and on the journey to the host house that we are actually probably going to do some games as well. Like you would might yeah. do that when you're in the car and yeah. I spy or the alphabet yeah. game. Or, yeah, or you might whatever. do that. You might do that. We all, we used to sing a lot, actually, particularly on the way home. That was always really interesting. Um, and some of that Liz recorded uh, for her PhD. It was the energy that was in the car going home after a day out and the the spontaneous singing that we used to have in the car it was wonderful and then you know the journey used to take an hour probably you know and we got through an awful lot of songs in that time um and everybody joined in and it was very funny and it was lovely I went to the funeral of one chap a lovely chap called Ken who was one of my darlings absolute darlings and he his daughters never met me and when they knew it was me they said oh you're Libby can you please tell us what did dad do because he couldn't remember and they said he, he all he'd say was she gave me a kiss in the morning and a kiss in the afternoon and she was a very good driver. <laughs> and he always came back singing, apparently. But, you know, he did because he sang all day when we were at home and in the car he used to conduct going home. So, you know, it was just a lovely thing and it didn't matter that he couldn't remember because they knew how it made him feel. And he had a different mood, you know, very different. I was going to ask that, Libby. I was thinking about, 
you know, that feeling of when you've come in and you've had a great day and it sort of stays with you, doesn't it? It, it makes you feel happy when you're having your tea. It, it stays there. And I was just wondering if if you'd sort of dug into that a little bit more. I know you sort of suggested it with Ken that he's coming in and he's singing, but for other people, you know, how does a day with you sort of leave them? What, what stays with them? Yeah, well, I, I, I can't tell you exactly what it is, but I know... I know we get huge feedback all the time about the difference a day makes. And that's one of our strap lines now, what a difference a day makes, because it really does. It's not medication and it's 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 about the benefits of being human. Um, and we know that if somebody has been, you know, as I talked earlier about that sense of uh, stress that somebody with memory loss might be encountering, to feel calm and to feel that they belong and feel that they're valued, that will have a significant effect on their well-being and you know we don't talk about it as a cure i'm not you know i will be remotely conceited enough to say that but it does it there are elements of recovery if you like that we see every day with many of the people that we support and that runs on to tomorrow and we have i mean i don't know if you look at our website you'll see there are some just exact word for word testimonials i think somebody put on there that they 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 knew how they could negotiate with John, the carer, because he if he knew he was going to the Philo project on the Tuesday, he that helped him stabilize him. He then came to the Philo project on the Tuesday, came back much better for it, and on the Wednesday he was then looking forward again to the Thursday. So those are the kind of benefits that we get feedback about a lot. Somebody's maybe more manageable. Um, because they're less agitated. Um, you know, the carer, the significant help for the carer, you can never be un under underestimated. And there's so much talk about carer crisis. I mean, my goodness, we see it. I mean, you must see it. We see it in huge measure down here. And um, there's very, you know, typically what's offered is a sitter, a sitter service, two hours. But, you know, it's again, it's not asking, carers what they want or what they need really a, a carer needs a break and, and and if the cared for can come out and go out for a day and if they're happy to do that what a difference that makes to the carer because the carer can then has a choice a lady in Sidmouth said to me a few weeks ago she said she found out and the first thing she said was I'm looking for some respite and I said, OK, that's fine. Um, how, 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 you know, you tell me a little bit more. She said, she said I, I just want a day of respite. And she said, I don't want to go shopping. <laughs> because she'd been told she could have a, a sitter for two hours so she could go shopping. She said, I don't want to go shopping. And, you know, that's re re really resonated with me. So what, what's happened? Her husband, who we thought would be difficult to place. He's now on his I think, sixth or seventh week. He's hasn't missed a Wednesday. She has the chance to do whatever she likes. She's actually quite physically quite well. So she gets, she loves walking. She likes doing nothing. You know, she could go back to bed and sleep because her husband's up in the night. She's got that choice. And that's what we need to give carers is choice. Not just tell them they can have a sitter because typically you've got good sitters and you've got not such good sitters. I mean, you know, and and quite often it's quite easy, isn't it? Just to put the telly on and just sit and watch daytime telly. Single worst thing for somebody with dementia is putting the television on. So if you can get the cared for out, we, we are alleviating carer crisis. We know that all the time. And we I can't tell you the number of referrals we've had. You know, it's off the scale and most of it's care of crisis at the moment most of it is yeah oh I love that I, lo I well I don't love care of crisis I love that you give you're giving someone a whole you're giving mm. them a day like two hours what can you do in two hours Not nothing more, really, really. and also get... you know in, in the best one in the world typically somebody who comes to be to as a sitter isn't really going to have the time to really get to know somebody unless it's somebody on a really regular basis it's going to be it's going to be a you know, a, 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 a box ticked, isn't it? That's the yeah. thing. Yeah. And actually six hours, it could be more. So where we have a care of crisis, what we try and do is get the route, the car route, so that we would pick up somebody in that situation first and drop them back last to really maximise that carer break. And some people don't like going in the car, so we, we pick them up last and drop them off 
first. Do you know what I mean? So that's the thing when you've only got you've got the you've got the ingredients to really be creative. And that's what I love about it. And, and we don't spoil it by just thinking, oh, let's let's get 10 because you would spoil it then because you, you it would completely spoil the whole point of what we do. And the whole point of what we do is the is, is in that value of the host to say for sometimes five, sometimes three clients. That's the core number that works. And anything more is too many and anything much less is too few because it puts a lot of pressure again on the person with dementia. If they, Because typically if you're one to one, what happens? You ask questions all the time. You know, what did you do yesterday? Did you see your daughter yesterday? I can't remember. How does that make you feel? You can't see whether, know whether you saw your daughter yesterday and so on. So instead of cramming more people in, we just have more groups. So we have um, just shy of 100 groups running a week now. And Devon and Somerset and um, about 20 uh, will be coming in the next couple of months um, so it's constantly growing new areas all the time and it's it's a it's a it's a model that it's a model for now isn't it it's a model for our society it's not a model for yesterday really no it really is I was thinking about so if you've got a hundred groups running, have you got about eighty people working with you? Because some of yeah. them do yeah, two some weeks. some work some work three days a week. Nobody works more than three days a week. It's quite tiring work, I have to say. I mean, um, you know, it's full on, but it is work. It's um, and they're not volunteers, and I'm again really clear about that because I think we put too much emphasis on expecting people to do something for nothing. Why should you do a really valuable job like this and not get paid well? I mean. So they're employed. They're not zero hours. They're employed by us. Um, some some do three days. Some most do two. Some do one day a week, going to two. We don't really want somebody to do one day because it, typically with a good host, they'll they'll be full before you can say full. And then a lot of people will have a second day very quickly. So um, uh, clients, that is. So we always want that capacity to have more. Um, yeah. So we've got um, I think something like seventy hosts at the moment um 20 support staff um and we get and we grow so as we get more groups we get area coordinators and we have a service manager now and we have um so as the structure grows we grow with it so we just increase our structure um and one pays for the other really do you know what i mean mm, i do um oh that i've got two questions now and it's just so uh, which one shall i ask first mm. um how do you look after your hosts then so it feels like I don't imagine you've got a great turnover in your house. They're not getting no. burnt out by what they do. No. So they have, we have very, well, I do, I do think it's one of the most important things. We, when we built, um, when we started the Fino project, we wanted to raise the bar of what good care should be for the, for the, for the, for the people who work with us, not just the people who are receiving the care. And I, I have to say, you know, I don't think I was particularly well looked after when I was hosting for Age UK Exeter because I, I was just kind of like I was in a boat floating on my own in my own little private ocean and then I was okay about it but I, I didn't really feel supported I was given quite complex people to deal with and didn't really have any support and I that's but that's a good thing because it made me realise what I didn't want for my my staff and. So we, they all have area coordinators who, as I say, do the assessments. They also support the host. So they'll always be there on the first day of a host group, a new host starting. They're the contact with the families. Um, they will do the risk, the, the area coordinators will do the risk assessment of the host. So we know, make sure that everything's, you know, as it should be. If they mentor them as they're going along, we, we you know, there's a, there's a good, um, a good back office kind of connection between all our our staff because they're all remote workers but we have um an online chat you know forum where everybody can get involved we keep everybody involved as much as we can and there's a great evolution as well so my service manager now who's who's magnificent she 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 approached me seven six six years ago from Lyme Regis and she'd heard about the Fido project just starting and she said you know she's really interested but we didn't have anything in Lyme Regis I mean we weren't even remotely in that bit of going towards Lyme Regis so but I really really liked her and about 18 months later we started to get some inquiries for that end of Devon and she started to become a host she got to three days a week and then I I thought mm, I just think she's great she lived in Japan for 20 years she's really interesting I mean that's what we want is people who are interesting and have life's experience and whatever that might be um 
bring that with you to us that's what we like so it's not you don't have to be in fact we quite like it when people haven't come from care if you know what I mean I mean we've got some really good people who have come from care but we quite like it if they haven't because then they come with a very open mind um and anyway Caroline then became team uh, AC she's now then became a team leader for Somerset and now she's she's just since September she's been service manager and she's magnificent so but you know a lot of our team have so hosts have a sense that if they're good you know they some of them become client assessors some have gone on to be area coordinators uh, tomorrow I've got our board our first board day we've just got a new board coming on which is really exciting and um five of my team are coming to meet the board you know they're across the across the spectrum hosts area coordinators and Caroline so I suppose it's it's a culture. It's not something you can just create and say this is our culture. It's not something you can just write. It's how you. It's what you feel. And they love the work they do. They really do. And um, and they're very well supported in the work they do. And they're paid very well. So all those things. And there's no shame in being paid well for what you do. No. Mm. And it's it's so hard, isn't it, to get that right culture? Mm. You know, it's it it's. Yeah, it's um, recruit, recruiting the right people. You can see you can see that where they're coming from. They're on the same page as you. Yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, we have a, we have a very a really interesting recruitment uh, process and several stages of triaging, and I think that's really important. So how people come across to us, how how they communicate, um, how they how, just how they approach us in the first instance. They have a an online interview now and, and we do all of that before we then even meet them so we just get a sense because that's incredibly important they they are ambassadors for us it's really important that we know that they're you know what they're like and you get a sense of people and I'm a great believer in in humans um Emma I mean I I I think there's so many good there are so many good people out there and there are so many we we you know people say to me oh god how are you getting on with the recruitment and I have to say We've never been busier. We have so many people working for us and it's wanting to work for us. And so we must be doing something right. So I just think, well, go figure. You know, what are you doing that's not attracting them? You know, I think that's yeah. the thing. I mean, I literally want to move to Devon now and come work for you and, and make sure I get a house with a, a, an inside down. Down space, Lou. Minimum <laughs> yeah. step. I was thinking, I've got one in the yard. Is that all right? There's one in the garden. It's a bit cold in the winter, but you'd be fine. Um, how how much does it cost? What's it, I don't, like? I'm paying for it, so I'm a private client. How much would it cost me to come to the Philo project for a day? It costs the same for you as a private person as it does to the local authority. There's no differential. Um, it's sixty pounds for the day, including lunch. Wow. And transport transport's extra oh okay um, well yeah, so they do, they do, yeah they, they, if they if they have our transport which most do it's an it's another eight pounds but not everybody does so we don't put that that's that's an extra thing okay. but yeah so it's the same for everybody there's no we have no discount for local authority because they don't give us any preferential i mean you know the days of block contracts and you know wasteful stuff like that i would have you know we, we we we're the lead provider in somerset now when when three years ago they stopped they're just this is anecdotal but three years ago i think they're um they had a virgin had a, a you know old people's uh dementia uh, you know daycare contract i think it was six hundred thousand pounds a year and they had 30 service users i mean i i'd love to have six hundred thousand pounds a year you know for six, 30 service users so that we have spot it's all spot contracts as you now these know these days and um that's fine that's fine but they don't get any prevent preferential treatment from us um so it's the same for everybody and i like that i think it's how it should be i think everybody should have the same value and you shouldn't pay more just because you've got the funds do you know what i mean yeah no mm. definitely mm. <clears throat> i wonder if like i've got one last question and I, and I suppose it's sort of i've got two last questions but i, I want to dig into like someone who's come to you recently who's struggled at home maybe lived on maybe they're on their own living at home i just because I think when you tell the stories about people, that's when what you do just like mm -hmm. comes to life. So I just wonder if you could bring someone to mind who you could share their story. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that is the thing is because if you you wouldn't you if you if you had a bigger group, you would not have the chance to get to know people intimately or or spontaneously, shall we say. Um, I mean, there's there so many stories. I mean, I haven't hosted for many years, but like the one, the stories I personally hold, I still hold dear, like the Barry one and the poetry. There was another lady we had called Vicky, who um, 
who got to 99 on our uh, on our watch um and she you know just just talking to her you know she couldn't remember that she lived with one of her daughters in Exeter at all she didn't even know she lived in Exeter anymore but she remembered so vividly the wartime years and and we didn't put wartime music on just that, again it's that demeaning assumption that because somebody's lived through the war they therefore want to to, to listen to wartime music I think that's a huge mistake because for some people war was immensely traumatic but for Vicky she was actually had a really quite a good war if as wars went because she lived in London she was fluent in French she translated for uh de Gaulle in the when he was in hiding in the second world war so she had this wonderful stories coming out and there was a song I put on once and I can't remember what it was and I said gosh this is so romantic isn't it this song and it was and I couldn't remember just thinking about her in those years with probably no light but you know that snatched love or those moments of romance that would have would have happened and it was so evocative and it was the kind of thing for her talking about it again and for her to just live it again a little bit with music was just amazing but you can't contrive that 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 is something that just happened in that moment and i think that's what i would say there are different stories um, that you get from everybody. Everybody in any of our groups, you'll get different stories. But, you know, it's it's that in the moment stuff. It's treating people and, and not making judgments because of what you think they might have done in their lives. Because everybody will have done something good or had some good story to tell or some interesting news to tell. And it's just how it comes out, really, I would say, rather than anything specifically that I can recall I and mean, I ought to know lot because I get told interesting things all the time I'm just trying to think what I can anyway I might come back to me in a minute okay. but carry on I'm gonna I'm just gonna invite people so we've got a couple of questions in and um, this is your chance now to pop your questions in the Q&A if you haven't done already okay so we're going to come to Claire she said can your host care for people on days out who need help with being fed going to the toilet and maybe need a wheelchair that's a really good question Claire um so the answer is yes and no. So um, when we do our risk assessment um, of both, well, of, of, of a potential client, we have to know because our, our hosts don't provide personal care. So I should have said that at the beginning because they can't do everything. And actually, if we, if we were doing personal care as well, I don't think we would be able to do, they wouldn't be able to do what they do. We could do personal care. It's not, we can't, it's perfectly legal um to do it there's nothing wrong I just think it would take diminish from the day so what we try and establish is that somebody coming to us is mobile enough to be able to mobilize from their home into a host car and out again the other end and into a host home and to be when I say independent with toileting we prompt of course we prompt um and to some extent, we, we you know we have got some hosts who will empty catheters, but we don't expect hosts to do that. We've got one or two ex nurses who are perfectly happy. So if but if they weren't, we wouldn't accept that client. Do you know what I mean? So wheelchair access, um, generally no, unfortunately, because again, it 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 would it probably goes with other issues. But we have got one or two clients who might access a car from their own home and out again with a wheelchair, but then have a frame in the house. So I, I, I don't like to say categorically yes or no. We had um, we have had people uh, who need help with feeding. But if somebody is probably beyond maybe beyond our reach, if, if those various things that you, you mention um, all apply, should I say, I hope that's yeah. a, an OK answer. Yeah, no. Um, is the Philo project just in Devon? No, it's um, Devon and Somerset now. So we arrived with, with, to, to the top to two counties completely. And we're now looking at how we take our model elsewhere. So anybody's got any ideas will always be gratefully received. Um, whether we do it with a social franchise or whether we open new branches that we're, we're looking at those both options strategically. Um, we've got a lot of, in, lot of interest coming to us from all parts of the country. Um, and, you know, we never went into this to try and be uber successful millionaires. We're never going to, you know, we don't, we're not gonna make lots of money out of this. That isn't what drives us, but we have a very good formula. And it isn't just a question of four, four people and a host. 
a lot of people have copied what we've done and they haven't really lasted. I think it's understanding much more. And we've got a very coherent back office now with a, a system that supports all our automations across the board. So we now know that we can go somewhere else. So we're probably going to dip our toe into Cornwall quite soon. And that would make sense. So we're Cornwall, Devon and Somerset. And then we look at going somewhere much further away, potentially. And how do we do that? So we will we'll be looking for people who have a similar vision, who'd like to work with us. Um, you know, not as a not as a financial franchise that you'd get with home instead or something, but where there would be a, a financial commitment, but an investment, but in a in a much more holistic way, should I say? Does that answer your question, Claire? I hope so. Hmm. I think it does. I'm just looking in the comments because I know Kellen had dropped some in there. Oh, she says, I've been looking for something to do a couple of days per month. That makes me, this makes me happy. <laughs> oh, that makes me happy. I think this is it. You have to do more days than that though, Kellen. Libby's not yeah. going to take you on for two days a month. You need to do it like a few more days. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because um, again, that's why we don't have, um, it's lovely to hear your enthusiasm, um, Kellen Lee, but I, I, um, yeah, it, 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 uh, it's funny because if you have, if you, if people volunteer, then of course, you know, it might be somebody my age who might say, well, actually, didn't I tell you I go to Australia for the six months of the year to see my daughter, you know, so it is a commitment. It's a two way street, really. It's it, they're employed and paid well, but it is a job. So we have they have six weeks holiday a year, but it is a regular thing. It's every week, you know, whether it's one, two, three days a week. Um, but it's nice to see your comments. Um, yeah, it's really good that you understand that about music. Um, I mean, it's, that makes me sad now because the Alzheimer's Society put all their singing for brain online now, I believe. And, uh, you know, I think that's so sad because, you know, if, you, if you're somebody with significant memory loss and you're plonked in front of a screen and you've got 30 faces all singing at you, I just, I just don't know how beneficial that's going to be anymore. And I think they're missing a trick. And I think we need to get back to that face-to-face -face stuff more. And that's what we'll be doing with our hubs, you see. So we're going to hopefully open some hubs around and about and, you know, bring people in again. Let's do normal stuff. Let's have art, life drawing. Let's do pottery. Let's do dancing. Let's do singing. Let's have carer support where people can come in confidence as a carer to have a really good carer support session. Cared for can go off and do something else that's, you know, carers can get together with carers I know when my children were small particularly my first one I mean you'll remember this you know when you're up in the night three four five times a night when you had a tiny baby you, you talk to your friends about that experience and actually made you feel a bit better and I think that's that's something that carers need as well and it doesn't really happen now Libby, you maybe that's just... in Salford <laughs> oh well yeah a little bit a yeah. little bit um you can't just casually drop in there oh and that's what we're going to do with the hubs you've like gone this 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 and then like in the last five minutes oh we're going to set up these hubs and we're going to yeah. do this this and this what yes. what's a hub yeah. you know with all, well, all the models yeah. been about in the home so what what's this hub yeah. going to be so the hub is well it's quite a big dipping our toe into something completely different and i've been very keen for so many years to say we do one thing and we do one thing well and we haven't done the age uk thing with respect to age uk we're not chasing funding pots to our existence. We're self-sufficient, we're self-sustaining. But what I think is, and, and it's more and more borne out by what I've seen, particularly in Somerset, is that is the face-to-face -face stuff has gone. And actually um, people want human contact, just as they do in our groups, but people do, you know, as well as carers. And I think that we need something in a nice place which could be a community uh, ac accessed where people could come and, as I say, have have time there, decent coffee, decent cake. They could we they could be on a journey, a pathway with dementia as a carer or a cared for. They could get professional advice. Potentially, we could have phone lines to give local advice to people living, you know, their families in Somerset. Not going to a national office. Um, you know, challenge the Alzheimer's Society because they've all gone on virtual now. They're not, they're doing very, very few face-to-faces. And I think that's a huge mistake. Say to them, okay, you come in, you can use our building. You can come in and you, you have a presence. You're supporting people on their pathway by an NHS contract. You need to deliver, come on in, you're most welcome and bring the 
the, the, everybody together in a collaborative way as, as a community building could. So we're thinking of a mothership that would be a, a first um, bigger hub and we could have quite a lot of staff there. I mean, I want to do things like, I mean, I'm probably a bit ambitious, but I want to do life drawing. I want to have people doing pottery, not just men in sheds because men in sheds has been done elsewhere. We could do that too, but you know, we could have access to, to nature. So we could do walks, we could do forestry. We could, um, you know, I don't know, you could do all sorts of things and create something which I think people, there would be a huge uptake for. I mean, I know this because we do an expert task and finish group. We have talking to carers of what they want and what they need. And they all say they've been very let down on their journeys of support. So we know what it is they want and actually have a, an in-person in singing session you know, not just online. I think the danger is, and you know this, Emma, um, we talked earlier, didn't we? It, it, I could have just done a talk here, just stood up and read off a script, but to be interactive, it's it feels a lot better than, than a lot of options. And it's been too easy, I think, just to say to everybody, oh, let's do it online. I just think it's been too easy to do that. And we need to rail, rail that back a little bit. So that's that. Exciting times mm. then, exciting mm. times for the Philo project. And I love how you, you like the Philo project, you're calling it the mothership. It's, <laughs> I can see it, I can see what it looks like. It yeah. sounds amazing. Can you taste it? You can taste it. There I you can are. Taste There's it. your I can taste Philo it. imagery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, we're in our last, oh, we're in our last minute now. Um, oh. So if you have anything you want to say, please say it now. Not you, Libby. <laughs> Although you can obviously say something. I think I've said enough, to be honest. <laughs> Anybody else? Normally, this is where people go, oh, I mean, you know what? Absolute inspiration. Um, just well, thank you. It's just been fantastic. Just yeah, brilliant and inspiring. Thank you. It really is, isn't it, Kellen? And learned so much. Thank you. It is, it's just such a you just make it sound like really easy to well, do. It, you know, it, it is, it's just fun and it, we love it. So it's, it's, it can be, this is why it needs to be everywhere. So everywhere has got a Fino project. I mean, you don't need to, we don't need to keep it in just, and we now worked out how, how we've got it to the plate scale where we can scale it. And we know that's what's wanted. People are approaching us, local authorities are approaching us, but how do we do it? So that's that's why what we'll be looking into in the next year or two is is how we do that or, or sooner. I mean, we've got plans afoot. And, and so we, you know, we need people with energy and who have a shared vision and a momentum. I think momentum is the big thing who have a who who understand what it is. And, you know, we're not we don't won't just do it with that. It's like we won't just take anybody to work with us just because they want to work with us. They've got to be the right people. And so we'll be looking for the right partners and. Um, in the right places and and off we go so it'll be an yeah, interesting challenge and it'll be different to rural devon and somerset and so forth so you know i hope it, i hope it's going to be like the suet the suet project when you come up north <laughs> <laughs> i like the short crust if you go short <laughs> oh oh claire said fabulous work libby we need more philo projects um oh. all over the country we really do jail do. jail for a moment there it did look like jail i just decided <laughs> not to read the jail bit out yeah. Right, we Thanks. are at 2.30. Libby, yeah. it's been like the best hour of my life. Thank you oh. so much. It really oh, has. It's just been, I keep saying inspirational, but it has. It's just been so fantastic to listen to the work that you do down there. And I definitely want to continue having a conversation with you, if that's okay. Of course, of course. Well, thank you very much. I, it's been lovely to be engaged with you. And um, I really, really enjoyed it. And I, you know, sometimes I dread these things a bit, but I, this has been lovely. It's been um inspiring for me as well and it's nice to be able to talk about these things in a in a natural way you know and um and you know not seeing your lovely uh, audience but thank you all for for, for listening to me rambling on <laughs> brilliant all right okay. i'm gonna i'm gonna say goodbye now and thank you again libby it's been brilliant yeah. and i'll okay. see you all soon take care bye bye